Sarah for the invitation to participate in this symposium. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're all here because we recognize that small populations are expected to have reduced adaptive potential to environmental change in comparison to large populations. And this is due to the fact that in isolated populations, genetic variation is eroded more rapidly due to drift and inbreeding as the effective population size is reduced. And this theoretically, this loss of genetic variation theoretically should reduce overall adaptive potential. Now, empirical studies testing these predictions, overall predictions in nature, are actually remarkably scarce. Much of what we know about the, the, the role of effective population size in influencing adaptive responses to environmental change or more fitness responses to environmental change are largely based on laboratory studies of fruit flies and bacteria. Of course, these species and these kinds of lab studies have many important opportunities or, or advantages in being able to have replicated populations and to be able to look at population responses over successive generations. <coughs> Nevertheless, the environmental conditions of these lab studies do not necessarily adequately portray the habitat heterogeneity that we find in nature, nor are the biological characteristics of these species necessarily common or applicable to some of the kinds of species we're interested in from a conservation standpoint. And so what I want to try to do today is to um, bridge some of the current conservation or, or knowledge gaps that we have regarding small population responses to environmental change by overlaying results from a series of different observational common garden and field experiments that our lab has conducted over the last several years on the same set of natural populations. So our study species is the brook trout. This is an endemic freshwater fish in eastern North America. It thrives in cold water, headwater streams and lakes uh, where a lot of other species are not found. Um, it is an important conservation species for recreational subsistence fisheries. It's often used as uh, an indicator of aquatic ecosystem health. Now, relative to a lot of other vertebrates, brook trout are probably one of the most highly structured species in terms of the population and genetic structure. In the northern part of this range in Canada, literally tens of thousands of distinct populations of this species exist. Um, in the southern part of the range, many species are becoming fragmented due to a number of different human activities. But I think it is important to emphasize that in much of its northern range, brook trout populations are naturally fragmented in lakes and rivers that became isolated from each other after the last deglaciation between about 7,000 and 15,000 years ago. Okay, so we studied the genetics and the evolution of naturally fragmented brook trout populations in the southeastern tip of the island of Newfoundland, a place referred to as Cape Race. Um, it's well known to be the uh, location where the first distress call from the Titanic when it was going down was received. The populations originate here from a common ancestor. Uh, the best available evidence that we have suggests that these populations have been isolated for several thousand years at the minimum, perhaps up to 10 to 12,000 years. A main benefit of studying the trout populations in these streams is that the environments are very small. And as you can see, each one of them terminates as a waterfall directly into the Atlantic Ocean. So we can confidently confirm that these populations are physically and genetically isolated from each other. <coughs> There's also no, or very little anthropogenic influence within this area. There's no fish stocking. Uh, between populations and there's no fishing. The size of the fish is very small and they're not of interest to anglers. So the small size of the streams allows us to comprehensively sample populations and we can confidently determine over many successive years how abundant each of these populations is and what their effective population sizes are. We know that they vary dramatically in these parameters and the variation that they express is of interest to conservation and population geneticists. NB here is the effective number of breeders, and it is the effective population size basically for a cohort. So how many adults contribute offspring to each annual cohort within these populations? The important point is to convert NB to ME in these populations, you basically just have to multiply approximately about, about two to two and a half. So many of the populations that we are working with have effective population sizes of 50 or less. Now this might be found on a very fine geographic scale, you often see tremendous trait differentiation amongst these populations, so you can walk from one hill to the next, to the, to the next drainage, and even populations separated only 300 meters apart will have, have up to threefold differences in mean trait, mean trait characteristics for the same age individuals, whether you compare them in the wild or in common environmental conditions. 
Okay, so as expected, in the system, small brook trout populations have disproportionately less neutral genetic variation when we conduct uh, assays of neutral single nucleotide polymorphisms across the genome. Um, but when we generate very large numbers of full and half siblings uh, within each of these populations, we rear them under common environmental conditions, we find no evidence for a positive relationship between the amount of additive genetic variants underlying different traits and population size. So whether we look at morphological, life history, or behavioral traits, small and large populations in the system have very similar levels of additive genetic variants. We've also investigated the relationship between population size and the extent of phenotypic plasticity uh, that the different populations may exhibit by generating, again, large numbers of families from individuals from the wild and then rearing them under the same environmental gradients. So these figure panels illustrate how individuals from different families and populations either survive or grow when uh, experiencing conditions under simulated climate warming. So at the left, population reaction norms do, the differences in population reaction norms do exist for the different kinds of traits that we look at, but in general, those reaction norms are quite subtle in terms of their differences, and there's no relationship or association with population size. At the right-hand side, each of those black dots represents a distinct or an individual family within each population, and the magnitude of the phenotypic plasticity that its members express across the different kinds of thermal regimes in this particular experiment. There were no differences in the extent of phenotypic plasticity amongst these populations. And again, uh, even with the inclusion of small populations that in nature would have effective population sizes of 50 or less. <coughs> these figures show the percentage of coding region <coughs> SNPs linked to functional traits in the genome of brook trout that are putatively under balancing and divergent selection as outliers in differentiating population pairs of various and the effective number of breeders. Now, signatures of selection were present at adaptive loci uh, in all the small populations that we researched in this particular study, despite their reduced neutral variation. And the greatest signatures of selection were observed among small versus large population pairs or among small population pairs themselves. The greater variability among small populations in this system is consistent with what we know of habitat variability in the streams within this region. So small populations do in fact harbor smaller streams, as illustrated in the bottom middle panel, but small populations have more variability in their habitat, their mean habitat parameters, and, they, and their coefficients of variation for a series of different habitat variables that are important for this species' survival and growth in nature. Okay, so results from several of these studies overlaid on the same population system thus far support that compared to large populations, we see that small populations do have less neutral genetic variation. However, they exhibit similar levels of additive genetic variation, similar levels for extent of phenotypic plasticity, and they have similar indications of adaptive differentiation at functional loci. That small populations experience environments with greater environmental variability suggests that many different environments may be associated with small population size in nature, and that different small populations may harbor unique adaptive variation. So while the results of the studies have just shown you are useful, what we really want to know, of course, is how do small populations respond to environmental change in nature. And the nice thing about Cape Race as a system is that it is full of these small, isolated fishless ponds that vary dramatically in their environmental conditions. So what we've been able to do is transplant controlled densities of juveniles from the different populations to investigate their responses to abrupt environmental change. This involves standardized collections and transplants of trout from single populations to independent ponds in the early summer. And then in the early fall, we go back and we capture all the remaining survivors and we can look at trout uh, survival and their overall growth. Now, because we have a good knowledge of the system, um, with this background knowledge information on the different populations, we can then look at, through a series of doing a large number of these transplants, what the best predictors of population responses are to environmental change, including, for example, just the environmental variation found within these new environments themselves, the size of the populations, the uh, extent to which they exhibit, the, the, the quantity of uh, genome-wide variation that they harbor, the degree to which each of these populations has experienced environmental variability in its past, at least over the approximate decade or period that we have studied these populations now, 
and the degree of environmental change that each of these populations experience going from the home stream environment to these new novel pond environments. We found that genetic variabilities or past environmental history within this experiment had no influence on survival in new environments. The main influence on survival were habitat variables, chiefly pH and temperature, and maternal effects via the initial body size of the individuals that were put into the ponds. So individuals from all populations survived better in less acidic ponds than when they were in initially larger body size. Survival also decreased as temperature increased, and this is to be expected for this cold water fish species. We thought that an increasingly stressful environment would have had a disproportional impact on small populations in terms of height, acidity, and the stress that that imposes, but we found that all populations performed equally poorly under increased environmental stress. Growth was also entirely explained by habitat variables. In this experiment, not genetic variables as expected for a cold water species of trout. Growth was optimal in temperatures between about 12 to 16 Celsius. Um, and it was also higher, we, see, we exhibited or, or observed higher growth rates in deeper, presumably less stressful ponds. It's important to emphasize that growth is a reasonable proxy of fitness uh, at this life stage for this particular species because a large size, um, it's important for these fish to obtain a large size before their first winter because it enhances their overwintering survival. Okay, so in our field experiment then, genetic variables were quite intriguingly not linked to fitness under environmental change. Um, it appears that these small isolated brook trout populations are quite capable of having long-term persistence in nature and they can still respond to abrupt environmental changes. It is only when populations are transplanted to extreme conflict conditions, environmental conditions in our university's wet lab, and reared under a single generation that some of these effects of small population size or gen lower genetic variation are first evident. All populations uh, exhibit significant mortality in the captive environment but and have overall poor lifetime reproductive success, but nevertheless, it's the populations with the reduced heterozygosity that exhibit the poorest performance and experience the greatest phenotypic change relative to their wild counterparts. The implication from a conservation standpoint is that the nature of novel environmental change that wild populations experience is likely going to influence the degree to which those classic genetic, genetic effects of small population size will be a concern. So why in general can small isolated populations of the species persist over long time periods in nature? We think or suspect that they could overcome some of the maladaptive effects of small population size. The mechanisms for this ability may relate to a partially duplicated genome, uh, being highly fecund, perhaps past purging of mutational load, and living in environments with few other competitors. We do not necessarily think that the species is an anomaly. The history of many freshwater environments, including much of northern Canada, is one of a serial episodes of fragmentation, isola isolation, and recolonization through processes such as glaciation, deglaciation, and isostatic rebound. So perhaps other freshwater species also have been able to overcome the same kind of maladaptive effects of small population size to persist in these environments. So overall, our work suggests that small low diversity populations of some species can be important sources of variation and may be capable of maintaining long-term fitness in and ultimately potentially adapting to changing natural environments. If we can determine, of course, which species and populations this applies to most, certainly this would benefit the field of conservation in terms of how it prioritizes its <coughs> resources. There's still much to learn about which metrics may better predict adapt responses to environmental change in nature. Um, the research that we've done on this particular species suggests that the utility of commonly adopted metrics such as neutral genetic variation or additive genetic variation are likely to be very context dependent. Thank you very much.
you're trying to look at all these different patterns and really large numbers of individuals, but realize right away that some of these populations are just very stressed out when we bring them from their native environments into these Catholic places. So I think it's only under really extreme situations in this particular species where you might see that kind of relationship with genetic variation and, and, and fitness. Otherwise, in conditions that it's naturally exposed to in the wild, the, the relationship appears to be weak. It's really interesting. And some of those population sizes are so small. I just was curious if there was anything known about any demographic mechanisms that might enable persistence, like negative density dependence or anything else. Um, it's an excellent question. So I think this species, I, what I suspect is probably going on is that because of the nature of being highly fecund and, and carrying a significant amount of genetic variation in terms of the duplicated loci in much of its genome, probably what happens is that in, in every single cohort there are lots of gene combinations that do not work, but because the, the species is highly fecund and it's got a, a, a quite short generation time, two to three years, it seems like enough to kind of can get through even if there are, there's a certain degree of maladaptation at, at an average level across each cohort. And so demographically speaking, it can, the, the species can basically fill the carrying capacity in whatever, whatever size the, the habitat is available to it. Thanks again.